Welcome back. This is uh, Intro to Physical Anthropology, and I am David Leitner. I'm your instructor. Um, today, uh, we are talking about, um, we, we've talked a lot so far about uh, Gregor Mendel and the patterns of inheritance he um, discovered, um, but today we're going to go a little bit beyond that, as the title suggests. Um, since Mendel's discoveries, we have found that actually very few genes, at least human genes, actually follow that pattern. And so I, um, I want to give you some examples today of why that is, uh, and also to give you a better idea of why when people claim to have discovered a gene for X... Uh, whether it's a gene for breast cancer, a gene for tasting salty foods, or something like that, um, that it's not as simple as it sounds. That, in fact, actually, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean that, uh, for instance, if it's breast cancer, it doesn't necessarily mean that if we eliminate that gene, then everybody will get rid of breast cancer. There's a lot more that goes on with the trait. Um, so, with that being said... Let's go ahead and get started. Okay, the first thing we need to sort of understand is that this is all about variation. Okay, genes are a source of variation for um, natural selection to work on. But things can vary in a couple of different ways. We can talk about qualitative variation, which is phenotypic variation that can be characterized as belonging to discrete observable categories. What does that mean? That's when you have things that don't have a lot of in-between states. Um, uh, wine varieties, for, for example. You can have, if you, if you go by color, you have reds, and you have whites, and you have rosés, more or less. Um, you can go to a little more deeply and sort of come up with other varietals as well. You can name wines by the region they're from, right? But all of those categories are discrete. That is, for every one of those categories, the answer to the question, is it X? Is it an X? Is always yes or no. Never kind of. Or sort of. It is or it isn't. That's a qualitative, that's varying qualitatively, okay? In other words, the quality of the thing, a quality of it, is varying. Quantitative variation, on the other hand, is measurable, and therefore there are in-between states, right? So that's phenotypic variation that is characterized by the distribution of continuous variation within a population. That's a fancy way of saying um, if you charted out um, the measurement of this trait for every individual in the population, you'd end up with something like a bell curve, okay? A standard distribution of variation. Um, a great example of this is height, okay? Height, you know, we can arbitrarily say you're 5'1", you're 5'2", uh, but it's just as meaningful to say, uh, I don't know what 5.1 and 5.2 are in metric, but that you're 153 centimeters or 163 centimeters. Like, those are, you know, those are categories, but we're kind of drawing them arbitrarily to represent the fact that this varies continuously. Um, so quantitative of variation is measurable in those kinds of terms. Weight, height, um, even some things that, colors that sort of are expressed along a gradient, for instance, would be quantitative because you could sort of measure the amount of reflected light, for instance. Uh, that's true of skin color. We can measure skin reflectance, that is the amount of light reflected off the surface of the skin. Um, versus the amount that's absorbed. That's a measure of skin tone, skin color. And we can measure that uh, quantitatively um, for a population. And what we always find is that there's a distribution curve, a standard distribution. 
Um, the reason I bring this up is because Mendelian traits often, actually almost always, are qualitatively varying. Uh, they vary qualitatively. That is, they belong in distinct categories, right? We talked about blood type when we talked about Mendelian genetics, uh, and you have blood types of A, blood types of B, and blood types of O, right? Uh, you're, you, those, um, and some variation of, of those when you start talking about re RH positive and negative, but the main hemoglobin types are A, B, and O. Um, and you're one of those. Okay. Um, so that's qualitative variation. Now, when we measure, one of the things we're interested in in genetics is not just measuring the pattern of inheritance, but just how much of that inheritance is due to the genetics and how much of it is due to environmental factors, okay? Um, and the way we measure that is we look at the amount of variability caused by genetics, divide it by the amount of variability caused by genetics, plus that caused by environment. Well, how do you do that? One of the chief ways that um, it's been done is through either cloning or twin studies. Uh, not cloning in humans, we don't, that's illegal, um, or at least highly frowned upon by international agreements. Um, but twins present us with another opportunity for that. Uh, twins are very nearly genetically identical. In fact, actually, they're 99.999999% genetically identical. Um, so when you compare twins with a particular trait and raise some of them in different environments and raise others together, you can compare how much of the variation is environmental versus genetic. Because if the trait um, is identical in the twins, even when they're separated, you know, then you know the environment had very little to do with it. Uh, on the other hand, if it expresses itself differently in those twins, but the two twins raised together, um, it's expressed exactly the same, then you know the environment has a huge impact on that. And then you can sort of measure everything in between there. Um, it, twin studies are controversial, uh, or at least they are use, useful, but... They have their limitations. Uh, number one, ethics. Um, the ethics of deliberately separating children at birth are pretty bad. So we usually use, uh, what we usually have to wait for is to find twins who were given up for adoption to find those twins that are going to be raised separately. So we have to look for people. So, so that, and then in addition to that, we don't have, we can't really control the environments they're raised in very well. Uh, because that's unethical. That would be unethical as well. So um, uh, there are limitations to twin studies. That said, um, they are useful when we can uh, um, use them. <clears throat> now, if you are interested in Mendelian traits, uh, there is an online list called the the OMIM, the Online Mendelian Inheritance in Man website. It's um, uh, the it's um, it's an NIH National Institutes of Health website that um, catalogs all of the Mendelian traits that have been discovered and what they do and all the information about them, how prevalent they are. Um, there are lots of different kinds. They range everything from, you know, uh, earlobe formation. Are your earlobes attached or are they little flaps of skin hanging out in the middle of the air like mine are? Um, but, um, when you're looking at a Mendelian trait, you're looking at a trait that is inherited in the exact same pattern that we see predicted by Mendel's, um, uh, postulates by the Punnett squares and so forth. However, 
as I said before, the vast majority of genes don't get inherited in that pattern. What we, or sorry, I should say the genes do, do, but the vast majority of traits aren't necessarily, they don't necessarily have that same pattern. And that's for a number of different reasons. Um, uh, sometimes genes have distinct biological effects. So the gene produces the trait. That's, it's a straight line through. Other times a trait can be caused by multiple genes. Skin color is a great example of this. Um, something like 378 genes that we know about so far, all playing a different role and to different degrees uh, in the determination of skin color. Um, that is a polygenic trait. Okay. There is also pleiotropy, which is when a gene can be expressed in multiple different ways. So the same gene depending, and we'll talk about this in a minute, depending on how they, both alternative splicing that we talked about in the last chapter and uh, genetic switches that we'll about, we're about to talk about, uh, a single gene can produce multiple effects and multiple different traits as a result. And then finally, and this is very often, this is, can be often the tra case as well, you have a combination of polygenic traits and, and pleiotropy going on. Um, so you can see there are lots of different ways that things won't look Mendelian when you're looking at the traits. Technically, the genes themselves are still following the pattern, but the trait might not get expressed uh, in a particular generation because of these other possibilities. Um, all right. Uh, there's also the fact that genetics has a bad history of trying to create genetic explanations for things that aren't necessarily genetic. Um, and a classic example is looking at the genetics of intelligence and the study of the genetics of intelligence. Um, not saying that no studies of intelligence are valid. There are some. Um, but the problem is the category of intelligence itself is a very poor scientific category. Uh, it's mostly just a folk category we all sort of use. We all kind of know what intelligence is, right? But if I ask you to actually define intelligence, you would quickly find out that every definition you come up with is missing something. There, I can always point to something that it's missing. And uh, intelligence, turns out, is actually probably multiple different um, mental capacities that we have. And, of course, it uh, environment plays a huge role in it. And when you're measuring it, cultural bias plays a role as well. Most IQ tests uh, um, that have been used to measure intelligence have, been, have done so inaccurately, in part because they did not take cultural variation into account. One tried-and-true... Um, uh, 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 instruction when it comes to administering IQ tests is you cannot measure population I performance performance on IQ tests in different populations. You cannot compare between populations because environment is such a huge factor. And it's very rare that two populations grew up in exactly the same environments. So when you see... Um, academics who claim that there are measurable differences in intelligence between different races or ethnicities, which has happened recently, I should say. This is not, this is not, and, and they're usually writing books that get, you know, sold in Barnes & Noble rather than the typical academic fair. Um, and, um, and they're wrong. They're wrong because their methodology is bad. So there's that problem as well. So in addition to there being complex biological causes, the act of measurement sometimes is biased, and we have to be very careful about that. Um, to give you an example, too, a trait can be passed on very, in a very Mendelian fashion, but it is the environment that will determine whether the trait takes effect. Um, phenylketonuria is um, a trait 
uh, in which uh, it follows an autosomal recessive pattern. So you need two copies of the um, uh, PK gene, uh, PKU gene, um, in order to um, exhibit this trait. If you have one functional copy and one non-functional copy, then the functional copy compensates for the non-functional one. Um, it results in an inability to uh, metabolize phenylalanine. Um, and the buildup of phenylalanine in the body, because you can't um, metabolize it, will then interfere with the normal development of the individual. But phenylalanine isn't everywhere in the environment. You get it through eating things, and certain foods have more of it than others, and many foods have none of it. And so if you can keep a child from consuming phenylalanine containing foods, if they have uh, PKU, then they will never develop the negative traits that um, might otherwise occur. Um, so there you've got an interaction, very clear interaction between the exterior environment of the individual and the genetic, uh, the potential, the genotype and the potential of those genes. Um, but the environment is also a lot more, the idea of the environment in genetics is a lot more complex than that even. In genetics, yes, there's an environment outside of the organism, but there's also an environment in the cells themselves, in the DNA. Uh, the environment is not just the things surrounding DNA, it's what other genes are present and how they are creating molecules that affect the way other genes are expressed. Um, so we can't just limit ourselves to thinking about the environment as just a thing outside of the organism. So how does this work, this sort of genetic environment? Well, there are two main kinds of genes. First, we have structural genes. Structural genes are the kinds of genes we've been describing so far. They their entire purpose is to produce proteins. Now, they might produce multiple proteins through uh, alternative splicing, like we found out last chapter. But um, uh, in typically, though, um, uh, they just produce a protein. Now, they are surrounded themselves by regions that have binding sites for, that will um, regulate the, uh, um, the, the transcription of that gene. So if a, molecule, a particular molecule lands on a particular binding site, it might promote the, uh, the uh, transcription of the gene, meaning increase it. It might inhibit it, which means to decrease it. Uh, it might terminate it, which is stop it. It might initiate it, which is start it. So there are lots of different ways and lots of different site binding sites here for these regulatory molecules. Regulatory genes, on the other hand, are entire genes. They're the ones making those regulatory mo uh, molecules. Um, they are a different region. They are a different gene completely. They're not just a region of a gene. Uh, they do not produce normal proteins. Their proteins are strictly sort of molecules that are meant to uh, bind to regulatory sites. And they play a critical role, not just in normal function, and as we'll find out in differentiating your cells, uh, so that your brain does brain stuff and your heart does heart stuff. Um, they are critical in the development of the organism, that is sort of growing up how does the body grow and develop? Okay, so regulatory genes produce these molecules that bind to regulatory sites on other genes. And they can interact with it in four ways. Initiation, that starts the expression of a gene. It says, okay, now begin. Uh, promotion, which... Uh, um, increases the activity of transcription. So instead of 
it just sort of happening kind of slowly, it actually brings more transcriptase uh, into um, uh, and polymerase into the process to produce lots more uh, RNA molecules, mRNA molecules. Uh, in it can inhibit, so do the opposite. It can slow down the production of the molecule. And finally, it can terminate it. It can block it from happening at all. Okay. Um, we won't get into the nitty gritty, but there are some videos on the Canvas site that really do a good job of sort of animating this and giving you a better idea of how it, how it works. Um, so these binding sites are in effect switches, okay? Uh, they um, they control the production of the stuff you need to grow as an organism, and um, and they really are switches. They're either off or on, um, and when they're on, they're on, and when they're off, they're off. Now the interesting thing is. They are not all on in any cell in your body right now. Now, you started off kind of this way. You had these stem cells that didn't really specialize in anything. That's how you began. It's just a bundle of these little um, totipotent stem cells. Totipotent meaning they can turn into any kind of cell. Uh, very early in the process of development in the womb, though, those cells began differentiating. They're receiving signals from from elsewhere in the in the mother's body, as well as signals from the other cells surrounding them, and that encourages basically this these genetic switches to start turning on or off. And it is the pattern of switches that are on or off that determined what kind of tissue those cells would become. Okay, so the fact that your brain does brain things and your heart does heart things, and your liver does liver things, even though, you know, your cells all began as stem cells, well, it's down to these genetic switches. Now, this isn't just about, you know, how living tissues uh, grow and develop. It also plays a role in evolution. There is an approach... Uh, some people call it a branch of evolutionary bio biology, though I think it's more sort of a way of thinking about uh, the rate and mechanisms of evolution than it is necessarily a discrete field. Um, there is an approach in evolutionary biology that basically says um, changes in phenotypes often don't happen in a slow, through the slow accumulation of mutations. Instead, they happen very rapidly in the fossil record, um, in evolutionary terms, rapidly, um, you know, over the course of relatively few generations. Um, and they're oftentimes very big changes, too. So, uh, you know, entire body parts can grow or disappear in a very short amount, amount of time. And so Evo Devo basically says, well, Okay, what happens in evolution often is that um, uh, not all mutations are the same. Uh, not all mutations were created equal. Mutations in some regions, particularly those involved in development of the organism, uh, can have drastic changes. So relatively small changes to a regulatory gene can have a huge effect on the way the gene it regulated gets expressed, and therefore the trait that gene codes for uh, will be different as a result. Uh, this is especially true of something called Hox genes, which are a category of genes in every living organism that um, controls essentially the shape of the body. It tells cells to, you know, that the head comes first and then the neck and da, 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 and all the way down. Uh, or the opposite direction. Some, some, we actually don't develop from the head down. We develop from the anus up. Uh, all mammals do. We're, um, uh, literally, you start off as an asshole. I mean, I've stolen that joke for somebody, but I, I love it. So, um, yeah, you literally start off 
as an asshole. Um, it's uh, it's your uh, it's your ancestry, and mine. Some of us more than others. Anyway, um, this is huge. So how does this happen? Well, there are a bunch of different ways. They're all mutations, but they're different kinds of mutations. Um, even more different than what we were talking about earlier. You can have gene duplication, which seems to happen in a lot of cases, uh, which can have a number of different effects, but largely sort of uh, will either increase the effect of that gene or or break it. Okay. Gene conversion, recruitment of genes to other functions. This is so common. Um, look up the uh, evolution of the bacterial flagellum. This is a favorite creationist talking point, intelligent design talking point that is actually, so be sure you don't get stuck on one of those websites, but look at evolutionist responses to um, explain the bacterial flagellum. And what you will find is that a structure that began to, as doing something, one thing, gets a set of structures, then get recruited to do another thing. Uh, and evolution starts working on that that way. Um, very much our trait of bipedalism, as we'll find out later in the semester, evolved in this way. It was it was the evolution of tiny traits that then got co-opted for one kind of locomotion that, when the environment changed, got co-opted for a different kind of locomotion. Exon shuffling. Okay, changing up which exons in what order go where. Um, so basically mixing up the puzzle. And finally, the addition of transposable elements. So what's the take-home here? The take-home I want you to take from this is uh, mutation is the biggest factor producing variation uh, that natural selection needs to work on. And therefore, you and I are mutants. Okay? We are both born into this world with probably 40 or 50 mutations our, neither of our parents had. So in other words, it didn't come from them. It happened at some point um, during the gametes' life cycle. Now what I want you to do, in order to understand um, genetic switches in evolutionary context a little better, they do a much better explanation than I just did. Go watch the movie Evolving Switches, Evolving Bodies. It's, uh, it should be up next on the list of lecture videos. Um... If not, if you just sort of Google that, you'll find the you'll probably find it on YouTube. Um, but uh, it does a much better job of explaining these things than than I just did, and um, it's a fascinating, fascinating story. Um, thank you very much, uh, and take care of yourself until next time, and uh, we'll see you soon.